Welcome to the Encore presentation of the UC Migration webinar series. I'm Rich Steves, web editor at TMC. And I'm Alan Percy, Senior Director of Marketing at Audio Codes. So tell us a little bit about the genesis of this series. Yeah, well, the genesis of the uh, UC Migration webinar series really comes from a conversation we were having with the Microsoft marketing and product management team. Uh, essentially, you know, we saw some challenges in educating the partners and resellers uh, as they begin to start to deploy Microsoft Link and, and make that migration. So what we did is we put together an eight-step uh, education series to help those partners and help end users understand you know, what's involved in moving to Microsoft Link and UC uh, so they can be better prepared for the, uh, the process that they're about to undertake. Tell us about these eight steps in the process. Sure. Well, the eight steps really start with, uh, um, we first start out with implementing instant messaging presence, voice, and video. Uh, then we're going to move to emergency services and E911 with uh, UC. Uh, then we're going to move to um, move off the PBX, which starts to talk about migrating uh, the customer from the PBX uh, over to their UC platform. Uh, th then we're going to move on to talk about SIP trunking and some of the cost savings involved with SIP trunking. Uh, then into mobility. A lot of organizations like to work in a very mobile environment, and UC mobility is a big part of it. Uh, then our uh, uh, sixth session is about um, branch office uh, deployments and, of course, survivability for those branch offices for retail uh, and um, uh, small branch uh, outlets. And then we're going to move on to call recording and compliance, which is really big for healthcare, legal, and a number of other applications. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with, with a session called Pulling It Together with Professional Services. Sounds like eight great sessions. Yeah, sure. We're looking forward to it. T tell us a little bit about the first session. So the first session, uh, we're really going to dive deep into the first steps involved with moving to UC uh, with implementing the servers, instant messaging, the different server names and, and uh, server pools, as Microsoft calls them. Uh, and what's involved in implementing those basics uh, to be ready for voice. So who are the presenters on this topic? So the presenters for the first topic are uh, Thomas Binder. Uh, Thomas is a voice architect uh, for the Voice Center of Excellence at Microsoft. Uh, he started to work for Microsoft in 2007 as a consultant, uh, and since then he's worked on some, a number of large deployments and, and led instruction classes on OCS and Link 2010. Uh, he's a uh, certified uh, master for OCS and Microsoft Link, uh, and we're really pleased to have him uh, as a presenter. Also, too, we're, we've got uh, Michael Nelson. He's the Vice President of Integrated Access Solutions uh, with over 15 years of industry experience. Michael Nelson is an expert in the field of unified communications. Uh, he's also a principal and co-founder of Integrated Access Solutions and also really pleased to have him to give some perspective on, uh, on the deployments. Great. Let's hear what they have to say. Sounds good. Thank you, Alan. Um, so, welcome. My name is Thomas Binder. Um, my agenda for the next uh, few minutes will be, actually I will be um, skipping the introduction about me since Alan already gave this great introduction. Um, we will start with the terms that Microsoft uses when Microsoft talks about unified communication. We will talk about how you can build a link environment so that you can get all these nice benefits from the unified communication solution. Then we will talk about how link can be integrated in the PSTN. And finally, I will put you to a list of resources that I would recommend. Um, as I said before, I'll just skip this slide and go right into the terms. Um, you will hear me talking a, a lot about a front end server. And if you come from a SIP background, a front end server is basically a SIP registrar. It does not much more, but the main role is SIP registrar, so I am um, instant message and presence, and the registration happens there. Um, also, we have in Link the concept of a pool. You can take different servers of the same kind and, and create a pool and it's not really different from a cluster, it's just another world. So if I a word. So if I'm referring to a pool, it's a group of servers that do the right the, the same thing. Um, we have the concept of a SIP trunk, though if Microsoft people speak about a SIP trunk, we are thinking about a SIP trunking provider that sits somewhere in the cloud and connects you to the PSTN network. Um, of course we can do a SIP trunk to a PBBX, but um, in, in Microsoft we usually refer as direct SIP if we're speaking about that. Then there's the concept of a conference. Um, whenever you speak with one person, we call it a one-to-one -one, one -to -one, or peer-to-peer -peer call, um, as soon as the third person is joining, it becomes a conference. And a conference can be on all modalities. So you can have a conference and on instant messages. You can have an audio video conference, desktop sharing conference, or all together at the same time. The last two words, two terms, well, 
um, if you are from telephony, you should be quite familiar with that. PBX, that's the private branch exchange. This is the equipment that you have probably on-prem, um, so that y you can provide telephony to your users. PSTN, on the other side, is the public switch telephony network. That's the whole network so that you can call people all over the world. Um, let's start with the requirements. So what do you need to have in order to install Link? Um, first, most important, Active Directory. So Link is based on Active Directory. All the objects, the servers, the users are created there. The information about the users in an act is in Active Directory. So this is where you start. Um, we need to have a forest and domain functional level, not older than 2003 native mode. Um, it's quite old, so I'm really hoping that you already have that. Um, if not, it's just the perfect time to go to a higher um, forest and domain functional level. So we support 2003 native mode, 2008, 2008 R2. Important, Link will require a schema update. So we will put, if you install Link, um, additional objects into your Active Directory. And active, to, be, to have Active Directory being aware of these new objects, you need to do a schema update. Very important as well, having a certification authority. Um, in Link, all communications will be um, encrypted. So server-to-server -server communications encrypted, server-to-client, client-to-client. We want to secure all your traffic, audio, video, instant messages. To be able to do that, you need to have certificates on all of your servers. Um, you can use private certificates if you have a certification authority. You can buy certificates from a public certification authority if you don't have one, but then you will pay for each additional certificate. So the general recommendation is for all your internal servers, use your internal CA. For your external facing servers, um, use an external, a public CA, so that other companies and users from other companies who want to connect to your environment, for example, for um, joining conferences, that they can trust your servers. And of course, DNS is required so that um, servers can be found and SAV records so that clients know how to log in to your servers. Okay, now let's build a link environment. The ver very first thing that you need to start with is the front-end server. As said before, front-end server is a registrar. It does IAM and presence, and you can co-locate additional roles to give it more functionality. Um, there can be an AD conferencing server co-located on the same machine and a mediation server. Um, if you want to co-locate the servers or if you want to ded have ded dedicated servers, it's basically a question of load and scalability. Um, depending on how many users you have, you want to have dedicated servers or co-located servers. The front-end servers, they come in two flavors, the enterprise edition and the standard edition. To the end user, they provide exactly the same functionality. So I, as an end user, I wouldn't know if I'm connected to a standard edition server or an enterprise edition server. The difference between the two is scale and high availability. So the standard edition comes as a single server box. It includes already the backend database that is stored to um, store information about meetings, about your contact list, about your presence and it can support about 5,000 users. If you want to have more users, then you need to look to Enterprise Edition. So Enterprise Edition, you can create a pool of up to 10 servers that will support up to 80,000 users. And you can have high availability. High availability means you lose one server, the other, server, the other servers will take over the load. So for the user, there shouldn't be any service um, interruption um, because there are enough servers who can still handle that. The Enterprise Edition server requires a dedicated SQL backend database. Um, because we don't want to introduce another single point of, of failure, we would recommend to use um, a SQL cluster, and we support here active-passive clusters. Okay, whoops, sorry, I skipped one. Um, the next role I want to speak about is the AD conferencing server. The AD conferencing server can be co-located with the front-end server. The only reason why you want to have a dedicated server is for scalability. So if you host more than 10,000 users 
on your front-end pool, then you should have a dedicated AV conferencing server. One AV conferencing server can support um, 20,000 users. Next role is the monitoring server. The monitoring server is an optional role. Um, and it does two things. It collects call detail records. So who spoke when, with whom, how long. And it does it for all modalities. Instant messaging, audio, video, conferencing. So it gives you really a lot of users in it, usage information. If you want to find out how much your environment was used, this is what you want to do. Also, it can be used to pr provide billing information. The second thing the monitoring server does is collecting quality metrics. It will collect information about the, about the endpoints. Um, to which network was the endpoint connected? Was it wired or wireless? Was the endpoint on VPN? Um, what device was the endpoint us using? Was it a USB headset? If yes, which USB headset was it? And it collects information about the network. Was there any chitter? Was there any packet loss? What was the round trip time? All of this information helps you determine how the user experience was. And if ever a user would say, um, look, I had a really terrible call, you can go into the quality um, of experience data, can drill down, can find the call the user is referring to, and then you will get all this information that can help you to find out um, what, what the problem was and how to fix it. Out of the box, it gives you a lot of uh, reports based on SQL Server reporting services. Of course, you can create your um, your own reports if you want to. And the server role can be co-located with, with the archiving server, this one I'm going to address next. It stores its data in a SQL Server, and you can use the same backend server that you're already using for your pool. I said the role is optional. However, I would really, really recommend to always deploy a monitoring server. Otherwise, you don't have any means to, to find out what the quality of the calls is that users are doing. Next one, archiving server. The archiving server um, archives all instant messages, including the content. So I can really see which user sent which instant message to whom at what time. Usually the discussion we have with customers here is privacy against compliance. So I'm, in, I'm based in Europe. Um, in Europe, privacy concerns are very high. Most companies are not allowed to collect any of this data. So these companies, they don't want to have archiving server. However, for example, in the banking sector, um, they have very strict compliance rules. They need to collect all the data. They must ever record everything. Um, they would install an archiving server for these compliance reasons. The archiving server can be co-located with the monitoring server and also stores the data in the SQL server. Again, this can be the same server. By the way, if you're wondering, you can almost every feature disable or enable on the per user base. So if you want to have some users archived, you can do this just for a subset, and for the rest, you don't need to do that. And this applies to all other settings like instant message, audio, video, and so on. OK, now let's talk about telephony. So we have our PSTN network. You want to integrate link into your PSTN. And um, one role that is required, while it is not a link server, it's an exchange server, is the exchange unified messaging. The exchange server. Um, provides voicemail for you for users so it will record voicemails and place it in your outlook inbox you can listen to it from the link client or from the outlook inbox and well every telephony solution in my opinion should have a voicemail this is where exchange um comes in the mediation server the mediation server is connecting the link environment to the pstn environment there are a number of different integration options. I will address them a little bit later in a later slide. And depending on the, on the amount of calls in your environment, you can co-locate this server with the front-end server. Now let's talk about external connectivity. Um, so on the very left side, you have the internet. Then we have an external firewall. We have our parameter network, we have an internal firewall, and we have a, here 
this director server. In the parameter network, we have the edge server and the reverse proxy. Let me just start with the edge server. The edge server relays SIP traffic, conferencing traffic, and media traffic from the internet to the internal network and the other way around. This enables a number of scenarios. The first one, remote users. A user from your company works from outside of the company, maybe on the customer side, maybe from home, and uses the Edge server to connect to the link environment and will get the full feature set. From a link perspective, the user will not realize that he is not connected to internal network. Everything will just work same way as he would be internally. So he can do it. I am, he can see presence, he can do audio video, he can join conferences. Next scenario is federation. If there is another company having OCS or Link, you can establish a federation, which is a trust relationship between your two edge servers. Um, this enables users of your company to use all workloads with users of the other company. So again, instant message and presence, audio video, conferencing, desktop sharing, everything will just work. Finally, we have PIC, Public Internet Connectivity, which is Similar to a federation, but not to another company, it is to the public um, instant message providers like AOL, MSN, and Yahoo. With all three of them, you can do instant message and presence. With MSN, you can do also audio and video calls. Um, they require an additional license. MSN and AOL is already included in the volume licensing. For Yahoo, you need to pay a per user per month um, um, uh, amount so um, that you can provide this functionality. On the Edge server, you can use, if you have a pool, you can use either DNS load balancing or hardware load balancing. We recommend to use a hardware load balancer, while we realize that this is an additional investment that also needs to be configured. Um, only the, the hardware load balancer on the Edge server will give you high availability for all features. If you use DNS load balancing, which is just the concept of having multiple DNS entries and using client logic to resolve to the different servers in the pool, um, if you use DNS load balancing, then you could, do not have high availability for federation with Office Communication Server 2007, Office Communication Server 2007 R2, and with PIC. The reverse proxy is also required. It relays HTTPS traffic. If you have an external client, the external client needs to download things like an address book, meeting content, and this goes over HTTPS. So everything is sent to the reverse proxy. The reverse proxy will terminate the connection, open a new connection to your internal server, and then proxy this information outside. If you have already a reverse proxy, because maybe you have Outlook Web App deployed, you can reuse the very same reverse proxy. As a Microsoft person, of course, I would recommend to use ISO server or TMG. However, any reverse proxy can be used. So if you want to use a different solution, as long as it's a reverse proxy, you can use that. For the TMG, we provide detailed step-by-step -step configuration how to configure it to be the reverse proxy for Link. And last but not least, there's the director server. The director server does two things. One, it's directing traffic. So if you are an internal user and there are multiple pools of servers, the discovery model that Link uses to find a server to log in will point to one of the pools. The pool will then look into its tables, will find out on which pool the server is actually home, and redirect the user. And this can put additional load to a pool. If you have a director, the DNS record to log in would point to the director, and then the director could redirect all the users, taking load from the front-end servers. That's one benefit. The other benefit is that the Edge server will send all traffic to an internal next hop server. This internal next top server will authenticate the user and redirect this, the traffic to the home server of the user. This can be a pool. However, that's a lot of load on the pool. Again, bring in the director. The director is the next top for the edge server. Um, so it can redirect all this traffic, taking off the load and providing an additional layer of security. In general, we recommend to always deploy a director 
if you deploy an Edge store server. Okay, so now that looks like a lot of server roles, and maybe you're thinking already about high availability, how much servers do you have to multiply that? So let me take a step back and, and reduce the number of servers a little bit. So the monitoring server and the archiving server, they can be co-located. You don't need to have two instances here. The AV conferencing server can be co-located with the front-end server and is only required if you have more than 10,000 users in your pool. The Exchange UM server, well, maybe you have already Exchange UM in your environment. Maybe you don't need to deploy these because of link. Um, maybe you just need to resize them a little bit, add another box, um, or reuse all the existing servers. The mediation server can be co-located with the front-end server. No need to bring in an additional box here. Edge server, you require it only if you do external access. Um, reverse proxy, well, also only required if you do external access, and maybe you have already a an, an, an reverse proxy that you can use. The director, it's optional. Even if you do external access, it's still optional. So if you look at that, not so many servers required. If it's a small deployment, of course, it scales. Now let's talk about the different options how the mediation server can be connected to, an, uh, to, an, uh, to the telephony. Let's start at the upper left corner with direct zip to an IP PBX. In that case, we have an IP PBX and we have the mediation server and we can use direct zip to connect to this IP PBX because they can talk zip to each other and can have a direct connection. Microsoft has a program called the Open Interoperability Program. In this program, different PBXs are tested and are validated if they can work with the mediation server. So you should do direct SIP to an IP PBX only if this is a qualified um, IP PBX. If you are now moving to the upper right corner, if you have a PBX that is either not SIP based, so it's a TDM based PBX, or it's an IP PBX but it's not qualified for link, then you can just bring in a gateway. And these are the nice devices that, for example, AudioCo is producing. Um, the gateway will take care of the communication between the mediation server and the PBX. Again, in the open interoperability program, Microsoft is qualifying gateways to get sure that all of this works as expected. Um, moving to the lower left corner, you can also use gateways to directly connect to the PSTN. So you can have um, E1s, T1s coming in directly to the gateway, and then the mediation server connected to the gateway um, provides the PSTN functionality. The fourth possibility would be having a SIP trunking provider, and the mediation server then would connect to the SIP trunking provider. Here in the middle, you will probably have either a gateway or an SPC, Session Border Controller, depending on what the SIP trunking provider wants you to use. Um, to find out who are the SIP trunking providers that can, can work with Link Server, again, Open Interoperability Program, we qualify those, and they will probably bring in some SPC or gateway. Um, for example, could be an SPC from audio codes, and here it is. Outside of this, Link has also a branch survivability scenarios. Um, I'm not addressing this. However, there is session six that is concentrated on branch office deployments and survivability, where you have a full session on this topic. And on SIP trunking, there's also a session, session four, SIP trunking turning on the cost savings. Lessons learned. Very important when you start, know your deployment goal. No, if you need, if you're doing just a POC, if you just want to test it, if this is just a first step where you want to experiment, in that case, standard edition server might be an option. However, if you know that you're going to scale eventually, um, you should go for enterprise edition. You can start with a single enterprise edition server without using a hardware load balancer, and then later on, when you introduce um, more enterprise edition servers to this pool, deploy the hardware load balancer then. Second important point is network. We are putting real-time traffic on the network. 
real-time traffic, we need good network quality, we need short round trip time, get sure that your network is able to provide the quality so that users have a good experience. Also, we will put new kinds of, of traffic on the network. There will be video, there will be desktop sharing, so you should really be aware of having um, the network ready for real-time communication. Open interoperability program, I addressed this several times. Um, get sure that if you want to integrate into PBX's PSTN, then whatever next top you use for link is qualified in the OIP. Devices, and that's a very important point that often is overlooked in projects. Um, if you have the best link deployment, you really scaled all the servers very well, you have a really great network. If users are using bad devices, because they have only this $5 headset they bought on the market, um, they, will not have, they will not be happy with Link. Get sure that you have um, uh, devices that are qualified for Link, that are optimized for Link. Um, there is a link to a website in the resources. It has proven very successfully to use the phased approach. Start with the internal deployment. So you can already use Link, you can already learn, your users can learn how to use it. Once this is done, go to external, go to PSDN. It doesn't have to be this sequence, you can also do PSDN first and then external, depending on your requirements. But this um, enables you to have a quick success in the internal deployment and then next quick success in the external and in the PSDN. Project doesn't get too big. Um, of course, these phases can uh, follow very fast on each other. Um, depending on how fast you are in rolling out. Don't forget about the user training. Link is a great tool. I love Link. I use it every day, every day. But usually if you go to users and just take away their hard phone that they are used to use and give them the new tool but don't tell them why it's great to have it, they don't really appreciate it. So show them the value. Give your users scenarios that shows them how they can work better now having Link. Okay, finally, resources. First link points to the public documentation that tells you really everything about link, how you can install it, how you deploy it. Next one is the open interoperability program. The third one is a list of phones and devices that have been optimized for link server. Then we have the next top block. That's the official block of the link product team. And finally, the last link is link.com, where you can find a lot of information um, around link, case studies, and so on. And with that, well, last thing, this is my email address. It's also my SIP address. Feel free to ping me if you have any questions. And that's that. I'll turn back to Alan. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. It was really great uh, in-depth view of the uh, inner workings of Microsoft Link and what it's like to do some of the initial deployment. So I really appreciate you uh, bringing that content, and uh, I'm sure the rest of the audience does too. Um, so next we're going to move on to Michael uh, from Inter Integrated Access uh, Solutions. Um, so Michael, uh, why don't you uh, unmute and uh, take it from here. Thanks, Emily. Glad to be here. Um, hello, everybody. Mike, ne Mike Nelson with Integrated Access Solutions. And um, for our section, we're going to start out with just a little bit of overview of Integrated Access Solutions, a bit of our background, and then I'm going to hand it off to uh, Bob Murphy, one of our senior consultants, to talk about a specific case study uh, where we deploy Link in a greenfield and that environment. So um, <clears throat> just a little bit high-low Integrated Access Solutions. We've been deploying uh, communication systems for over the last 10 years, um, lots of experience in gray hair, scar tissue, uh, lessons learned, best practices from thousands and thousands of deployments of IP phones. Um, over these past 10 years. So, you know, we definitely come from that traditional digital telephony background, moved into IP telephony around 2000, and then about three years ago started um, working with Microsoft on the unified communication platform uh, because we saw that was where the feature was going. We're very excited. Um, so, next slide. Um, you know, our focus really is on the mid-market to enterprise, uh, 250 seats to about 4,000 users. Uh, customers in pretty much every vertical you can think of. Um, you know, when we built this uh, this company, from, uh, this, this unified communication practice, we really had to um, really change our business model in the sense that coming from the traditional world, we had to um, bring in some Microsoft resources and understand, obviously, the different Microsoft technologies out there, Active Directory Exchange. So 
We've, uh, in the last couple of years, three years actually, since we embraced Microsoft, had to really do a lot of cross-training, cross-pollination between different engineering uh, expertise and resources to build this uh, uh, Microsoft uh, link practice, which is, which is definitely a unique skill set. Um, so in addition to, obviously, the PBX, we also focus on advanced communication applications like contact center solutions, IVR, self-service, dialer, um, and, di and different technologies in that area. Custom app application development as well. Um, so um, to start this case study off, I'm going to actually, in a second, you're off to, to Bob Murphy, but what uh, just my two cents on this is very unique in that this is one of the few uh, link deployments that, that we see out there in Orange County in Southern California where a customer really embraced Link as a PBX replacement, which is you know kind of unique and rare, and I, and I think we're, we're pretty proud of it because coming from that traditional fluffy background, we understand what it takes to deploy an enterprise PBX and all the considerations with respect to the network quality, assessments, carrier services, um, and that's a little bit uh, unique with Microsoft in that it's definitely not a, one, a single vendor solution. We have to bring in best-in-class vendors like audio codes and Plantronics and SIP trunking providers and put all these pieces together to assemble um, a nice uh, unified communication platform for our clients. So it's a lot of coordination, a lot of assessment, a lot of planning, um, but in the end, I think um, it's the best solution out there, and we're, we're very, we're very uh, excited about the future with Microsoft Link. So with that being said, I'm going to actually hand it off to Bob Murphy, uh, senior consultant with Integrated Access Solutions, and he's going to walk you through a brief case study um, with, one of our, uh, with one of our customers. Hi, thanks, Mike, and hello, everyone. Thanks for your time today. Um, I'm Bob Murphy, senior consultant, and I was intimately involved in the beginning, middle, and end of the project we're going to walk you through right now. And uh, as, as Mike said, um, this particular client uh, did a complete PBX replacement, and so Microsoft Link is their uh, enterprise voice platform for inbound, outbound voice customer facing and internally and um, so they were um, uh, you know it was it was a, a full adoption um, and it was pretty much a cutover from the old system to the new system so had some some of the traditional telephony elements of a, of a, of a system upgrade um, but with Microsoft link so um, I'm sure you've all read the slide by now. I don't need to walk you through that, um, but the major issues were uh, a very old PBX, uh, a major corporate relocation, and some pretty expensive conferencing and uh, collaboration uh, services that they were paying uh, on a monthly basis. And uh, that's uh, one of the areas that we were able to really eliminate some cost um, uh, some monthly recurring costs is by using what's available in Microsoft Link to replace those outsourced services. So, um, so basically, um, the conversation started out with we need a new PBX, we're moving, um, and as we kind of um, looked at all the business requirements and needs through the process, um, we started to talk to them about Microsoft Link and unified communications. And that all came out of um, needs analysis. Uh, it's looking at how they employees work together, how they face customers, um, and what are the different business processes that have to do with uh, sales, marketing, delivery, implementation, and support of a technical product. And just to add to that, Bob, we also did a deep dive into their current um, the telecommunications costs with respect to conferencing services, uh, PRI circuits, analog services. So really did a nice, uh, thorough, expense analysis of their current uh, environment, and that was part of this process as well. Yes. Um, and so uh, economic impact uh, studies, and then, um, uh, as was mentioned, you know, a good network is key, and with the corporate relocation, uh, we were able to design a, a brand-new network, which is not going to be the case for everyone. We understand that. But previous to that, we applied... Um, some of our uh, a particular tool that we use for network assessment that studies specific um, uh, network behavior uh, regarding um, you know real time things like voice and video and specifically links. So we're able to um, assess the customers 
environment with regards to application traffic and different things that are going on in the network that may or may not impact uh, a link deployment and, and do the analysis from a very granular level um, to decide how to size the network, where it could be improved, and in this case, um, it helped with the design of the ground up of a, of a brand new network for them uh, that we built with uh, HP core enterprise network switch products on out to um, uh, their entire global um, LAN and WAN. And so um, we did an impact study with, um, with that information for voice and video and um, also identified areas where there were enterprise uh, business applications where Microsoft Link could uh, be part of the business process and, in fact, be integrated um, with uh, certain business applications. And after all that, we put together some designs and the design options. Um, so what we came up with um, was a sort of a best of breed. And the, the interesting, what we find as industry specialists um, uh, that is interesting is how the voice system in the enterprise has been deconstructed. And so now all of these modes of communication are software-based systems versus hardware-dependent uh, technology like you would find in a PBX. And so um, we built the network with, with HP. The customer had a Microsoft Enterprise Agreement, so the, the link licensing was a, was a minor incremental cost to their existing EA agreement. Um, and the key for PSTN and enabling an enterprise PBX replacement was the audio codes PSTN gateway and all the functionality that that provided that allowed us to completely do away with anything like a PBX. And so that was a critical component. And then Polycom and Plantronics and some of the other endpoint devices, we actually, um, through our relationships with these companies, were able to deploy samples <clears throat> for a test group where we actually set up Link in the enterprise uh, for roughly 25 people so that they could um, get a feel for the different device options and get comfortable uh, so the users were actually involved in the decision-making of what devices they would use. And we also set up a lab where users who weren't part of the initial test group could go sit in the lab and try some of the different devices with real link clients and, and get a feel. So that really helped with the user adoption, and it really helped with um, the user experience matching the technology and the infrastructure uh, planning that we put into the project so that it was end-to-end -end a unique and good uh, user experience. Yeah, and to add to that, I think, you know, um, training is obviously critical. I think when you're uh, providing additional tools that people had not had in the past, you know, typically most people have just a phone or a digital IP phone on their desk, and now you're giving them this new technology. As mentioned before, training is critical. So this was a great opportunity for us to create like an internal pilot, a lab, for people to come in and test devices, uh, look at what device makes most sense for them, uh, and then also at the same time get a quick uh, training on Link itself. So when we roll it out to the enterprise and we did the, the first cutover of you know the initial users, everybody was pretty familiar with Link as a whole and actually felt pretty comfortable um, with, with uh, using the tool, and there were less help desk calls as a result. So, Yeah, very good point, Mike. I think that's really key, um, and I think it also supports the practice of phased deployment uh, because it gives people um, some time to get comfortable versus a hard cutover, which is um, disruptive and, and, and can have a different kinds of impact. So uh, we were able to, to walk them through all that and create an end user experience um, that delivered all of the, um, you know, sort of productivity claims and the different capabilities that, um, uh, that really have been part of the conversation about unified communications from back in the early 2000s when people started talking about it. Um, I think uh, Microsoft and with their partnerships with Audio Codes and Polycom uh, and HP and uh, some of the best of breed manufacturers is actually able to finally deliver a unified communications experience 
that other manufacturers still haven't quite come up to speed with yet. So um, uh, the teaming, the collaboration, the mobility, and all the different tools along with the replacement of expensive hosted web conferencing and audio conferencing, um, the, the economic impact was, was, uh, uh, was really minimal um, compared to what most companies go through when they do a major PBX refresh or upgrade or relocation. Absolutely. To add to that, before I go to the next slide, I think, you know, we were actually able to cost justify a lot of this acquisition costs and deployment costs through both those types of savings, um, centralization of, you know, trunking and things like that. So uh, moving on here to the next slide, Bob, I'll, I'll hand this up to you. Sure. And this is just basically a graphic representation of the work we do throughout the entire uh, enterprise computing and information environment to make sure we're fitting in, we're doing all the right things, and we're assessing everything so that ultimately uh, what you see on top is a uh, satisfied user experience. And this just shows the uh, global reach of this particular cu uh, customer and their ability now to collaborate and do audio and video uh, to foreign offices uh, over an MPLS network and really kind of unify their global teams so that everybody feels more intimate and gets the benefit of the unified uh, communications experience. And then um, finally, um, we were in a position to um, do a compare and contrast with uh, one of the leading offerings uh, through Cisco Systems. And what we were able to do is uh, look at the cost or economic study uh, based on a standard approach through uh, a company like Cisco um, versus this new approach, leveraging the Microsoft EA licensing and sort of the uh, uh, more aggressive um, players in the internetworking market, companies like HP, and then Polycom and Plantronics with their economic uh, endpoint offerings, and we're able to deliver a fully operational unified communications environment for um, really uh, half the price, and so that made the CFO very happy. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll look forward to any follow-up questions, and we're happy to be available to discuss any of this with you. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Bob. Uh, it was a great, a good background on a uh, real-world customer deployment. And uh, one of the things I liked about it, too, is you talked uh, about the social impact, about, you know, the training and the user experience, et cetera. So that was really good. Uh, appreciate you uh, bringing that to us. So uh, next we're going to spend a couple of minutes to just um, uh, talk about uh, Audio Code's role in all of this. Uh, and I know many of you uh, on the bridge here have, know who Audio Codes is, but there's also quite a few people here that I, I, I know are new to Audio Codes. And what I wanted to do is just spend a moment and uh, show you where we fit in the overall picture. And, and that is, um, you know, the communication industry really has shifted dramatically. Uh, as, you know, we know here from this discussion today about Microsoft uh, that they make pure software applications. There's a number of other vendors that now have shifted to this pure software model. And uh, to deploy those software products, uh, there needs to be some interface layer between the uh, software solution and the outside world, whether it be to the legacy TDM network or to the, you know, continuing evolving all IP network. And this is the place that AudioCodes has decided uh, is a good uh, fit for our technology and our expertise. So we make a number of media gateways. We make residential gateways, multi-service business gateways, uh, session border controllers. We also make some IP phones and lots of other little answery uh, call recording logging, uh, mobility, software, et cetera. And the, the intent is to provide that, that interface layer between the application and the outside world uh, with a goal of, of providing interoperability, security, you know, reliability, uh, all those necessary things to be able to deploy these, these uh, UC applications. Uh, one of the fortunate parts about our business is that um, Audio Codes has garnered a really good market position in the media gateway space. This is our most popular product line. Uh, our low density media gateways, uh, according to Infonetics, are some 46% of the overall market share, and the mid density gateways are roughly 37% market share. So we go toe to toe with some pretty fierce competitors in the space uh, and, and hold a pretty prominent uh, location in the market. 
So enough about us. Let's talk about uh, uh, the deployments that we're expecting in the market. So, you know, in our experience you know, working with end customers, what we see is a vast majority of businesses start pretty much at the same point with these two separate networks you see here in the diagram. You know, one is the voice network for the PBX and another separate network or LAN for their data, web, and email messaging. And in, like shown here, there's often no connectivity between the two. You can you can make telephone calls, you can leave and respond to voicemail messages and send and receive fax messages, but that's all done on the PBX. And meanwhile, the local area network provides access to the web, email, data applications. And it's really not uncommon to find businesses that are starting to use applications like Skype, Yahoo, or other hosted instant messaging services. But you know, this whole arrangement's far from secure. It's not well integrated, uh, and certainly not integrated into the Microsoft Office environment or into the voice network. What some businesses do is they uh, first employ Link without voice integration. And you heard from Thomas's discussion earlier that uh, you know that is a point at which you can build out uh, Link uh, and deploy it without voice integration. You know, using the platform for instant messaging presence and desktop sharing only. Uh, and just a note on a diagram here, I, I took all of Thomas's servers and compressed them into one icon. So um, I, my apologies for oversimplifying things, but you know what's inside that box. <laughs> um, it, and what happens is by deploying, uh, without deploying the voice features, you know, it's an improvement, but it, it, uh, it forces users to flip back and forth between platforms. And we actually, audio codes, we were in this situation for a little little while. Uh, you know, between the link and PBX phone, trying to flip headsets and switch between devices, and there was uh, no, no status integration. And it misses really some of the great return on investment elements of Microsoft Link, you know, using the voice over IP uh, to allow our workers to communicate from off-site locations or work at home, hotel rooms, you know, remote offices, et cetera. And, you know, we're forced, we were forced to use you know, cell phone minutes for toll-free numbers uh, you know, for conversations with people back in the office. And we sort of say this is like, you know, getting to first base, but really this is not, uh, really not leveraging the power of Link. Uh, you can in, well, certainly deploy headsets and cameras to the clients, um, but this limits your usefulness because you can only call other users uh, that are on Link system uh, that also have headsets or speakers. Um, you know, and what good is a client if there's nobody to call, which, you know, doesn't really make any sense. So um, next we're going to move on to the most popular method of deploying Microsoft Link, which is behind an existing PBX. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, you know, get the full value of Link, and we're going to integrate it into the PBX. Um, a couple of different ways to do this. this uh, the first um, mechanism uh, puts a media gateway between the PBX and the Link server pool. Now, ideally, this, uh, this gateway would integrate in with a tie line or a station site T1 circuit on the PBX. Uh, and then, of course, it's going to use Ethernet to integrate it into uh, Link. The benefit of this arrangement is, of course, it doesn't affect the, the trunking or the regular PBX traffic within the business, but um, there's a few challenges. And first of all, it requires some reprogramming of the PBX, and you know, finding somebody who knows how to program that PBX is always a challenge. And you have to add a T1 uh, or a tie circuit uh, to, the, uh, to the PBX, and sometimes those are expensive, they're hard to find. Uh, and they're, um, again, require some configuration. So um, let's just take a peek at once this configuration is deployed, what happens. And, and when, a, when a call originally arrives into the uh, PBX, uh, what you're going to end up doing is you're going to use some routing rules inside your PBX and look at the dialed number, uh, which we call a DID number, and you're going to route the call either uh, over to the link server pool uh, through the gateway, or based on the number, you're going to route it over uh, to uh, one of the existing phones that's on on the uh, PBX. And you know, if you've got the expertise and skills to manage the PBX, uh, this isn't so bad. But it, you know, it does get old, and especially if you put all that work into it, and then with a plan of removing that PBX in a few years, anyhow. So we've got a different architecture that we use, and this is actually pretty common. We call this uh, the drop and insert architecture. And what it does is it moves the PBX trunk, I'm sorry, the PSDN trunks uh, from the PBX to the gateway and then connects another set of T1s or E1s from the gateway back to the PBX. And you can sort of think of this as inserting the gateway between the PSDN uh, and the uh, PBX, and that's what we call a drop and insert. Uh, and the real beauty of this architecture is that the gateway makes the decisions now where to route the calls, whether to route the call to link or to route it to the PBX. And it's going to use tables inside the gateway. 
And one of the really cool things about this is that we have the ability within the gateway to use your Active Directory uh, to control that. And that Active Directory database, um, of course, would sit out on a server in, in your network. Um, so uh, I, let's see. So when a call were to arrive uh, in from the uh, PSTN, uh, you can envision uh, the call showing up. Now what's going to happen is that Gateway is going to either do that Active Directory database dip, uh, or what it's going to do is uh, use its own internal tables to make a decision. Well, based on that dialed number, I'm going to send it up to the link server, or I'm going to route it off to the PBX, which, of course, will deliver it onto the, uh, uh, to the respective phone. And one of the real beauties of this architecture, by the way, is this is going to help dramatically when we make the move to SIP trunking, uh, because the SIP trunks will terminate on the gateway uh, later, but we don't want to spoil the surprise that's um, a couple of sessions out in our series here as to how to do that. So what about IP PBXs? And you heard Thomas talk about this earlier in today's session. You know, they often use SIG, SIP for their signaling, too, and uh, some have been integrated to work directly with LINK, and that's that you know, full certification. And when that full integration is done, it allows the, you know, the IP PBX to sit on the LAN with LINK uh, and directly communicating passing calls back and forth between the two. And, of course, uh, to make this happen, uh, it has to be fully certified, and usually, uh, most IP PBXs require uh, a significant software upgrade to get to this level of uh, integration to Microsoft Link. However, uh, you know, in our experience, it's not uncommon to find uh, uh, older uh, IP PBXs out there or that are out of version uh, that don't have a Link integration. And in these cases, we're going to drop an enterprise session border controller in between the PBX and the Link server pool. And it's going to mediate some of the differences in SIP and the media sessions to do DTMF conversion, facts, and other incompatibilities uh, between the flavor of SIP that's used by the IPPBX and the flavor of SIP that Microsoft Link uses. And um, well, similar sort of call flow we're going to go through here. Uh, you know, call may come in for the PSDN, and that uh, IPPBX now would make the decisions about do I route the call off to the Link server pool. Uh, or do I send it um, over to the uh, IP phones? Uh, and one question that pops up is, well, what if, you know, what if somebody wants to call from one of the clients over to one of the uh, phones over the PBX? And this is, you know, and all the configuration showed earlier is handled. Uh, the call, uh, when it hits the link server pool, would be directed over to the TDM PBX or IP PBX uh, and back and forth. So the, uh, the dial plans would be programmed to allow calls to go back and forth. So you can call from a link caller from a link client over to a, a phone and back and forth. Um, so another question that pops up often is, so well, where do I find out more information about how to do all these integrations? Um, and we've, we've, what we've done is we put these materials uh, on the Audio Codes website. Um, you can find them on our link page, which is uh, um, www.audiocodes.com slash link. Uh, and all the really good stuff, like the downloads of all the documents, et cetera, require uh, registration on our site, and you can find uh, the registration icon uh, in the upper right-hand corner. It's where the word My Profile is uh, on my uh, current screenshot. But um, if you were to log on and you're not registered, you can see there's uh, a registration link there. And that's where a lot of those materials are stored. So as we start to move on and get closer to a wrap-up, uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to share with you some of the solutions that Audio Codes uh, has to implement these advanced uh, link deployments, as we've shown earlier. Um, you know, from our little two-port analog uh, media pack gateways up to our 16,000-port media 8,000, you know, we manufacture the largest family of media gateways, uh, uh, survivable branch appliances, and enterprise session forward controllers. And, we, and they're all based on this common core software and hardware platform. And this is really powerful because it helps our, our partners and our end users um, scale their solutions from the smallest little branch office up to the multi, uh, the largest multinational enterprise. And so it's a, a unique part of our offering is this tremendous diversity all based on, you know, common user interface, common protocol software, uh, which makes it a lot easier uh, for users. Okay. Uh, also wanted to point out, too, um, uh, uh, in addition to our gateways and enterprise session board controllers, we also have a really comprehensive support framework. And this is for our partners and our business customers. This includes um, a full circle of a project management, design, uh, planning assistance. Uh, we've got help for implementations, either remote or on site. Uh, and we can also offer further optimization of the network and, and implement, implementations. 
and of course the post sales support. And this is a, a really great and key resource that we think dramatically improves uh, implementation success rates, and we highly encourage our customers to uh, to leverage this uh, this team skills and capability. So, right. well, that was some really interesting information. Yeah, I thought so too. So what can viewers expect in the next session? Yeah, so session uh, number two is about emergency services in E911 uh, with, uh, with Unified Communications and Link, uh, discussing the process of, of uh, moving to a 911-capable UC platform and making sure your employees are safe and, and have the access to emergency services. Great, an important topic. I look forward to it. Yeah, great.